He's an assistant professor at my college in New York. He did his PhD study here locally at UC Riverside uh, uh, with the Professor Shane Witt. He serves as a Korean representative for the Science Fiction Research Association and is also the editorial committee of the Journal of Fantastic Arts. From that capacity, he brought out last fall this special issue of Science South Korean Science Fiction, which was the first of its kind. He is recipient of many awards, including Fulbright Fellowship, UC San Diego's Technology and Humanities Grant, and Uplifter Award by the International Association of Fantastic Arts. His presentation today is based on his forthcoming book, Speculative Orientalism, Asian Religions in New Age Science Fiction. Please welcome him with a warm applause for John. So um, my uh, manuscript and also the PowerPoint, the PDF file, I uh, uploaded it to my um, link tree website, which I edited um, at the last minute, but um, because I, we had to use the PowerPoint, so um, it's link tree slash S A N G Y O send you if you're interested in, um, or if you have any uh, problem or just any any difficulties of, of hearing, um, or um, if you want to look back, right? So. Um, and also my uh, essay um, about East Asian science fiction will come out in Korean Literature Now. I think that's a public magazine from the Trans Translation Institute, right? So, um, but today I want to fo focus more on, because there are some overlap between that essay and, and today's talk, but I want to focus more on, I wanted to talk something like a little bit bigger um, about where we are, um, you know, in East Asian studies in the, in the long history of Anglophone science fiction. So, um, I'm going to talk about 30 minutes about um, East Asian religions and myth um, under the history of American science fiction. So please bear with me. Right, so, so okay, let me start. Uh, this is the the order of the topics that I will cover today, one by one. So first, my academic interest in science fiction um, centers on this question: What makes science fiction science fiction? This inquiry became particularly important to me as an English major from East Asia. Um, uh, East Asia. So as a college student in Korea, learning and reading English literary classics such as Shakespeare, Jane Austen, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the Western world depicted in these works seemed completely surreal to me, science fictional to me when I was in Korea. <laughs> Growing up in Seoul, I, of course, I also read and watched uh, numerous Korean and Japanese fantasy narratives, including what we call in Korean, we, we also sorry, martial art fantasy novel like, uh, like uh, uh, there are many new also and there's fantasy novels like Dragon Raja, Temaro, if you are in China, if you spend, uh, share the same you know, background with me, you're probably familiar with that. Or Dragon, like Japanese animation, of course, like Evangelion and Dragon Ball, so first and so on. So to me, the realistically portrayed London in Shakespeare's plays, or Jane Austen, right, felt more science fictional to me than the futuristic universe of Evangelion. This suggests that the genre categorization can shift based on the reader's cultural context as perceptions of what is realistic, what is scientific, can vary across different nations and cultures. This personal story of mine underscores the challenges of defining science fiction, especially when considering the genre's global production. Even though defining it has always been complex among scholars, even before considering global science fiction. 
This endeavor to define science fiction has engaged numerous scholars for over 60 years, yet it remains without a definitive consensus among SF theorists. So in this slide, you can view the diverse definitions proposed by various SF theorists throughout the years. These diverse definitions each have their own uh, respective merits, but also their own limitations. If I categorize these definitions uh, based on similarities, the first group of scholars seeks to define the essence of science fiction through its connection to the hard sciences like physics and engineering. The second group traces its literary lineage, linking it to either modernism or Gothic literature. The third group uh, views it through its relationship with reality, suggesting that science fiction portrays what is not yet real but could potentially become so in the future. Among these definitions, the most influential and significant is undoubtedly Dark Assyrians. First presented in his 1972 article on the poetics of the science fiction genre, and later expanded in his 1979 monograph. Discussing Subin's impact, Mark Bold mentions it was Subin event. Jerry Kennebant, who was the immediate best, uh, president of SFRA, he also said, uh, not all criticism of SF is Subinian, but the field as a whole is Subinian, or post-Subinian. So how did Subin define the genre? Subin described the science fiction as the literature of cognitive estrangement. Although this definition has its limits, which I will um, explore later in today's talk, the major contribution of his definition is that he avoided using the term quote unquote science when defining science fiction. Instead, he substituted it with cognitive. By cognitive, he refers to a broader understanding of science, not just the hard sciences like physics and engineering, but also social sciences such as anthropology, sociology, gender studies, political science. For him, science in science fiction is almost synonymous with knowledge in general. So, the question arises, so why did Subin in the early 1970s feel the need to expand the definition of science to include the social sciences, even though this broader definition might dilute the traditionally narrower, thus clearer sense of the genre? So we all know that traditionally science fiction, um, especially the first half of the 20th century, science fiction was primarily understood as a genre focused on future science and technologies, featuring similar, uh, familiar themes such as alien encounters, AI robots, right, time travel. So many fans of her science fiction uh, felt be betrayed uh, by Suvian's new definition in the 19, early 1970s because they believed it stripped the genre of its essence. So this shift of definition occurred in the 1960s and 70s when Anglophone science fiction began exploring new directions with the onset of the new wave, what uh, as a theorist called new wave movement starting in 1964. So this period saw new SF writers like Ursula K. Le Guin who explored new topics such as Taoism, gender identity, indigenous philosophy in her science fiction work. Similarly, Philip K. Dick, um, the Shakespeare of science fiction, as Brian Aldis called it, delved into psychological and philosophical territories, exploring the nuances between reality and virtuality and the nature of perception, thus steering clear of typical hard science fiction tropes. Faced with these evolving narratives, uh, the science fiction community, including Dr. Subin, felt compelled to propose new genre labels such as speculative fiction, soft science fiction, lifestyle science fiction, to better capture these broader themes. Today, I think uh, science fiction communities prefer these two terms, speculative fiction or SFF, just as an umbrella term of diverse narratives. So what prompted new wave science fiction writers like Le Guin and Dick to explore these new topics in their works? SF theorists identify various socio-political contexts such as nuclear war, Cold War politics, anti-Vietnam war sentiments, second wave feminism, anti-racist human rights activism as reasons for this shift. Among these influences, FF theorists particularly emphasize the launch of the Sputnik as a major catalyst. So Brian Aldis comments, space travel was a dream. It was a part of the power fantasy of the SF magazines. When that space travel became reality, the dream was taken away from them. The impossible had happened people began to expect the unexpected. Adam Lovers also writes, by the 1970s, it became clear that space travel was a bit dull. 
These observations suggest that when space travel became a reality, any fiction envisioning it no longer felt as science fictional to readers because it was realistic, right? So Thomas D. Clarkson also notes that American SF, because of these changes, reached a cold stop uh, in the early 1960s because space travel could not sustain the genre of science fictionality anymore. So in my first coming monograph, Speculative Orientalism, I argued that new wave science fiction found a new novum, so science fiction or new idea uh, for science fictionality from Asia in the 1960s and 70s. There are numerous instances where American and British new wave science fiction writers incorporate Asian cultures, characters, places, especially religions, to estrange American readers in this period. So here are three major publications that as a theorist consider pivotal in advancing the new wave science fiction movement. Almost half of the stories in Dender's Beatons, in the first one, engage with Asia, and one third of the second one, England Swings SF, does the same. Also, during the first two years of Michael Moorcock, the new editor of British SF Magazine Numerous, almost every issue featured at least one story involving Asian themes, Asian religions, so forth and so on, and Michael Moorcock himself wrote and published four stories dealing with Asia during this period. So for me, it's very evident that at the very least, new wave SF writers held a significant interest in Asia, and at most, they had obsession with it. Numerous other examples from the 60s and 70s further illustrate this trend. So Ursula Green, who self-identified as a Taoist, she said many times she's a Taoist, translated the Taoist classic Tao Te Ching into English. So she said it's uh, not translation because she couldn't read the Mandarin, but uh, she got help from other experts. Philly Katie also referenced another Chinese classic, the I Ching, when he wrote The Man in the High Castle, also of Maze of Death. And I also tried to see uh, all of Philip Katie's short stories to find more examples. Um, he wrote 121 short stories total. And among those, uh, one-fifth, more than one-fifth, so total 24 stories involve Asian religions and characters. There are just too many examples uh, to list them all here, so I will just limit these examples to these two writers for now. But my point here is that since the new wave reformation of the genre, Anglophone science fiction has frequently sought science fictionality, novum, or estrangement from Asian culture, religion, and myth. So Asian culture have been, uh, has been pivotal in maintaining Anglophone science fiction's speculative essence. So for example, readers of the Philip Kiddick's Domain in the High Castle, an alternative uh, history novel, right, experience estrangement not because the novel is set in the future, not because the novel um, has future science, but because it portrays an Asian country dominating the United States based on Chinese philosophy of I Ching. Right? Similarly, Levine's novel, Late of Heaven, is not set in a futuristic world, nor does it feature scientific advancement, yet it still estranges readers because the novel is based on another Tao sage, like Lao Chi and Chang Chi, right? So, and the novel is based on Chang Chi's words. This led me to make the new term speculative orientalism in order to refer to how American SF uses Asian religions, cultures, philosophies as a framework to imagine alternative worlds. I argue that despite this work's seemingly positive portrayal of Asian religions and culture, they remain still Orientalist because they idealize, fetishize, and oversimplify Asian religions as simplistic solution to Western problems. So there are three types of Orientalism in 20th century Anglophone science fiction. First, traditional Orientalism in yellow peri genre. Second, speculative, or speculative Orientalism in New Wave SF, and since the 1980s, new type of Orientalism, which is techno-Orientalism in Cybertron. And I think speculative Orientalism still remains in American SF and popular culture. For example, in the Star Wars spin-off, Mandalorian, what captivates the audience is not the familiar, not the aliens hovering by, lightsaber, we, we already seen this like millions of times, right? <laughs> For the 60 years, right? So that doesn't explain us anymore. But the main character keeps saying this pseudo-Taoist phrase, this is the way. But the Taoists never say this is the way. That's the opposite, right? But the, the Mandalorian, the main character keeps saying this is the way, this is the way. 
And Doctor Strange, right, the main character, also travels to Nepal, Kathmandu, right, to acquire his science fiction superpowers. So, how have Asian American and Asian writers responded to these Orientalist tropes in Anglophone science fiction? In recent years, more Anglophone writers of Asian descent have emerged in the science fiction scene. Over the past decade, these, write, these uh, film directors and writers have garnered numerous Hugo and Nebula awards as well, in the literature as well, right? including Ken Liu, Ted Chang, Art Huang, Charles Hugh, Larry Saleh, and many others. And we have now the new publication from Duna. Right? Uh, there has also been a surge in East Asian SF available in English translation alongside many American Asian themed science fiction films and television shows, particularly following the immense success of Everything Everywhere All at Once. So, um, I, the, the conference I often go, I regularly uh, participate is IAFA, International Association of Fantasy in the Arts, and there is this Jason Brown, he's the Hollywood producer. Um, who uh, made uh, The Witcher, right? And then he, in, in his uh, roundtable um, talk, he said, there is, this is a quote, there is a pipeline of the similar theme to everything in Europe. Martial art, Michel Yeoh, and some philosophy of Asia. There's a pipeline is in pre-production -pre stage, right? So you saw like, uh, the brother's son after everything, right? And then the American born Chinese, right? The same recipe, right? So these novels and films often incorporate Asian religions and myths in distinctive ways within the framework of Anglophone science fiction. For example, Everything Everywhere at Once blends traditional science fiction elements like multiverse theory with Taoist themes of yin and yang to address intergenerational conflict and other things. And as I said, American or Chinese New Disney Plus uh, drama series is using uh, the myth of Sun Wukong, Monkey King, right, from the 16th century Chinese novel Journey to the West and can use standalone series, which uses uh, Chu Han conflict, right? And then ready-made Bodhisattva uses Buddhism. And the seventh day of the seventh moon, it has subtitle of Asian myth science fiction. Well, I think these are all good examples of showing that. While I certainly welcome and enjoy this new surge of Asian American and Asian science fiction works as a, as a researcher, I'm particularly interested in how these works challenge the Orientalist truths in Anglophone science fiction and also question the Sudanian definition of the genre. I argue that these recent Asian American and Asian asset works effectively highlight the limitations of Sudanian's definition, and by doing so, demonstrate the need to redefine the genre in a way that is more appropriate for the current globally inclusive era of science fiction. Ida Yoshinaga, in her article, Science Fiction Studies 3.0, Re-Networking Our High Mind, writes, quote, the Western SF and everything else model of the science fiction form, where the former serves as a star and the global legion of the latter are accommodated as orbiting exceptions to Darko Sui's definition of literature of cognitive estrangement, is over. So she calls for a new SF studies more appropriate in this new era, which she refers to as science fiction studies 3.0. I argue the problem of civilian definition in the era of science fiction studies 3.0 first and foremost lies in its hierarchical, hierarchical distinction between science fiction and other genres of speculative fiction, such as fantasy, folklore, and myth. Specifically regarding myth, he argues that while both SF and myth attempt to provide some explanations for social phenomena, Myths are limited because they view the world as an quote unquote illusory and fixed entity, whereas SF understands historical contingency and offers flexible and achievable solutions. So he writes, quote, SF sees the norms of any age, including emphatically its own, as unique, changeable, and therefore subject to a cognitive view. However, the myth is diametrically opposed to the cognitive approach since it conceives human relations as fixed and supernaturally determined." End quote. Therefore, he contends that SF is, in a way, a better genre for social progress compared to myth. This disregard for myth is not only evident in SF theory, like our assuming theory, uh, but also in recent post-humanist theories, I think. For example, Donna Haraway, in her influential work, A Cyber Manifesto, shares the challenges the notion of 
what I call original unity or completeness, which she identifies as a cornerstone of Western myth. She advocates for a redefinition of identity through the lens of the cyber, a concept that she argues liberates us from the constraints of the myth. So here is, the, uh, to be detailed, she particularly criticized Western myths, not the old myth, right? But still, there is this idea of distinction between science and myth. So these are the theoretical context for why I believe the SF community should pay more attention to recent Asian American and East Asian SF works. Asian SF demonstrate that SF and myth are not distinctly separable, rather they are mutually enriching. Furthermore, Asian SF exposes the limitation of the civilian definition of SF and underscores the need to redefine it with a newly conceptualized notion of science. Among many notable examples, today I want to particularly focus on Chinese-Canadian SF uh, writer Larissa Les, 2002 work, Saltfish Girl, as this work is especially relevant for um, today's discussion. So Larissa Les, Saltfish Girl, intertwines two distinct narratives, one spanning from ancient China's Christian dynasty to the 19th century, and the other set in a futuristic Vancouver, North America. This intricate blend of stories connects through the lives of four female protagonists, two in each timeline, crafting a captivating interplay of past and future at East and West. And here's a basic plot. The novel starts by exploring China's pre-Shang era, about 4,000 years ago, introducing the mythic goddess, uh, Nuwa in Korea, it's called Yowa, uh, the Nuwa in English, I think. Um, the creator of humanity, who is depicted with a fish tail. Uh, Niwa reincarnates as an Asian girl and falls in love with a young woman named Saltfish Girl. Together, they escape the confines of patriarchal families and forced marriages, seeking refuge in the Canton era, where they survive as sweatshop workers or pickpocket thieves. Meanwhile, in the futuristic part of the narrative, we meet Miranda Ching, a Chinese Canadian girl living in future Vancouver. This future world is dominated by corporate and advanced capitalism, and Miranda and her family face eviction from a safe, corporate-owned city and are forced to relocate to dangerous, unregulated zones. Seeking employment, Miranda finds work at a suspicious doctor's office, where she meets her new lover, Abby Sin. It is later revealed that Abby is not human, but a mass-produced transgenic cyborg clone. Abby shares a horror story about her origin. So her DNA was sourced through the unauthorized use of indigenous people's DNA combined with fish genes, 0.03. This manipulation was engineered by corporations aiming to bypass human rights obligations as technically she's not considered fully human. So Miranda and Abby eventually escaped the clutches of corporate control and the doctor's relentless pursuit echoing the, what happened in the past, right? New, new wine, soul fishers uh, escape from oppressive circumstances. So what makes this novel particularly compelling is that it actively engages with and parodies a diverse array of Euro-American myth and tradition and science fiction, challenging Eurocentric views by replacing it with Asian perspective. So this novel rewrites, orientalizes, and feminizes familiar European stories such as Christian Bible, Genesis, Greek mythology, Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid, and Shakespeare's The Tempest. Among these work that this novel parodies, uh, the most important for me is Mary Shelley's Dr. Frankenstein and Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. First of all, uh, this novel parodies Mary Shelley's classic Dr. Frankenstein, a text that many SF theorists argue as origin of the genre. In Shelley's Frankenstein, this creature is often seen as a symbol of the danger, dangers of unchecked scientific advancement, but Shelley makes this point using traditional Orientalist trope. So Dr. Frankenstein decides to abandon his creation upon realizing that the creature does not appear Caucasian, but looking like uh, an Asian, described as having yellow skin, yellow eye, black hair, and black lips, which, as Anne Miller argues, most of 19th century readers would have recognized as features typical of the Mongolian race. In Soulfish Girl, Abby Sin identify herself with Frankenstein's creature. She tells Miranda that her escape from the corporate-owned factory and its harsh working conditions was similar to the creature's journey in the novel. Moreover, like the creature in Shelley's Frankenstein, Abby also returns to her creator to take her revenge. 
This comparison highlights their shared experiences of oppression and othering as artificial creatures. But Swordfish Girl rewrites the story from the perspective of Abby Seen rather than from that of the doctor who created her. Similarly, Swordfish Girl challenges the techno orientalist tropes by parodying Blade Runner, a film that many SF theories argue that most representative example of techno orientalism. So, one most example, representative example of orientalism and right, no, right. But there are noticeable parallels between Blade Runner and Swordfish Girl. So, I made a table for your understanding. <laughs> uh, one scenario is feature an encounter between artificial creatures and their parental figures, so Tyrell and Flowers, and right, um, there's Asian engineers, Hannibal, Chun, and Chang. Uh, who, um, although Blade Runner, and also partially the original story, uh, Big World, Do Every Dream of Electric Sheep, portray Asians as if they are robotic, mechanical, and consumeristic. Selfish Girl challenges this trope by showing that the Asian clone Abby is not robotic, because she's Asian. Rather, she was made into a robot with Asian genes by greedy corporations so they can bypass the law and it's effectively exploit them. So it's like opposite, right? So in other words, while techno-orientalism portrays Asians as exploitable labor because they are robotic, the truth is the opposite. Asians were forced to become like robots so, they, so that corporations can exploit them. In this way, Selfish Girl debunks the traditional and techno orientalist tropes and reveals their problems by parroting them. Lastly, this novel also challenges the speculative orientalist tropes uh, by blurring the boundaries between science fiction and myth, weaving a compelling narrative that connects the distant past with the futuristic present. At the novel's ending, a surprising plot twist appears, thus combining the two seemingly separate narratives into one. So Miranda, who lives in futuristic Vancouver, turns out to be a reincarnation of Niwa. So in the future part of the novel, Miranda's birth was explained as being um, due to the genetically modified durian her mother consumes, which was invented to, to help infertile women become pregnant. Miranda's mother, who is in the postmenopausal stage of her life, had a craving for durian and she consumed it without knowing it is genetically modified. But at the end of the novel, it turns out that Niwa, in the past, who plunged into the river to escape is reborn as a minuscule entity who enters the very durian centuries later, who, uh, which uh, is consumed by Miranda's mother. So in this way, the novel massively blends the futuristic elements of science fiction with ancient aspect of Asian mythology, seamlessly bridging the gap between the futuristic North American setting and the mythic world of 19th, 20th century South China. The subdued nature of Miranda's verse presents two intriguing interpretations. You can read this novel as science fiction. Her birth, if you read it as science fiction, her verse can be attributed to GMO durian, a form of parcinogenesis, asexual reproduction. You can read it as a myth, right, suggesting that Miranda's life is divine reincarnation following Buddhist ideas, with Numa reborn as a human. So this deliberate fusion of dramas highlights the inherent interconnectedness of science fiction and myth, suggesting that they are not mutually exclusive, but rather complementary modes of storytelling that can illuminate the human experience in profound ways. For example, the mythic being Nua or Miranda, the same personnel, bears striking similarities to the scientifically imagined transgenic cyborg Abby. So Nua or Miranda, Nua slash Miranda, an other than human entity transformed from a fishtail guy, mirrors Abby's artificial cyborg form derived from 0.03% fish gene. So this convergence suggests that ancient Chinese myths of human origins from fish becomes tangible reality in the envisioned future of this science fiction novel. The notion of fish as human ancestors is not far-fetched, even within Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory. So Charles Darwin writes, Our ancestors was an animal which breathed water, had a swim bladder, a great swimming tail, an imperfect skull, and undoubtedly was a hermaphrodite. Here is a pleasant genealogy for mankind. Compared to the Christian belief that the first human was created from God's word and subsequently formed from Adam's rib, Chinese mythology aligns more closely with Darwinian theory which Lavi Saleh's work manifests as reality in the imagined future. 
The endless reincarnation of Miwa, first as an Asian girl and later as Miranda, reflects Buddhist idea of endless reincarnation, but also recent scientific discoveries that human genes outlive individual lives and contain transgenerational memories. This leads us to, to question the role of myth in the Sabinian definition of science fiction. The Taoist and Buddhist ideas, as well as Chinese mythology, are as cognitively changing as, as any science fiction novel, as any science fiction novel. So Sumin argues that SF is a cognitively cognitive approach to non-existent, thus estranging imagination. Right? So Sumin argues that science fiction is a cognitively approach to something that does not exist, right? However, what makes this novel science fictional is not its cognitive approach to its strange imagination. The referent the novel seeks to represent, the fact that human originated from fish and in our genes outlive us, is in itself cognitively strange. And the novel simply attempts to represent this. The novel happens to choose to depict it in two different modes, one through myth and the other through science fiction. But fundamentally, they are the same. Asian worldviews, religions, and philosophies, and cultures are already cognitively estranging to Western readers. Yet, they are real. This reality necessitates a revision of the Sudanian definition of SF in relation to Asian and Asian American SF. Therefore, what can be the new definition of SF in Science Fiction Studies 3.0? Literary scholar So Young Chu provides one solution in her book to Metaphor Stream of Literacy. In the book, she criticizes Subin's definition and provides an alternative concept. She writes, quote, my reconstitualization of science fiction can be understood more specifically as Subin's definition turned inside out. Instead of conceptualizing science fiction as a non-mimetic discourse that achieves the effect of cognitive estrangement through an imaginative imaginative framework, I conceptualize science fiction as a mimetic discourse whose objects of representation are non-imaginary, yet cognitively changing. Here she argues that SF is not a genre that represents non-existing imagined objects, but a genre that attempts to represent an existing referent or concept, which is extremely hard to represent because the referent is cognitively strange. For example, Soyang Chu writes the concepts such as cyberspace, artificial general intelligence, host memory, like we, in Korea there's concept Han, right? Uh, and transgenerational trauma are things that are hard to grasp or represent, therefore cognitively changing. Therefore, any fiction that attempts to represent them should be considered as science fiction. Regarding this, she adds that what most people call science fiction is actually a high-intensity variety of realism, one that requires astronomical levels of energy to accomplish this representational task, insofar as its reference, such as cyberspace, elaborately define straightforward representation. Lastly, contrary to Zubin's claim, this novel demonstrates that the, the myth is not necessarily quote unquote fixed and supernaturally determined. Larissa Lea demonstrates the multi-dimensional rewriting potential of myth and possibility of reinterpreting it as a literary tool to imagine better and alternative world. For example, in the original Chinese mythology, Niwa creates the world with her brother husband uh, Fuzi in Korean bookie instead of creating it alone. Sir Fisker changes the, this original myth by omitting Fuzi's role and attributing creation solely to Nua. Moreover, while the original tale depicts Nua creates strong ones into rich and weak ones into the poor following the existing sort of hierarchy, Larissa Le rewrites this narrative suggesting that Nua created the strong ones into women and weak ones into men presenting a more nuanced view of power and gender dynamic. Miranda, in the future part of the novel, also reimagines the same myth, modifying it with her unique perspective. For instance, her father tells her the myth of Nua and Fuzi in his original version, but Miranda imagines freely her own version 
that fits better to her worldview. So she writes, when my father shared those illustrations, he narrated the legend of Niwa and Fuzi. Yet, I found myself questioning their relationship. In my depiction, I portrayed them as twins, possessing an androgynous and a nearly distinct, indistinguishable appearance." Unquote. Through Miranda's artist, artistic <coughs> imagination, she transforms the Chinese myth, casting the traditionally heterosexual Niwa and Fuzi as androgynous twins. In doing so, she conceives an alternative historical narrative when characterized by gender fluidity. The novel extends even farther from the process of re mythologizing by demonstrating that myths can also be newly created, as illustrated through the narrative of Abby. As I explained before, the cyber clone Abby tells that uh, the origin of, of the human genes in her body stem from uh, the Genome Project, which the corporation uh, makes corp acquired from uh, the indigenous people. Despite this plausible version of her origin, she says that one of her clone sisters quote unquote, made up another origin story about themselves, and subsequently, some others continued to pro propagate this alternative version of their creation. So according to this fabricated tale, she says, a Chinese woman whose name was I married a Japanese man and endured internment camp during the war with her life ultimately claimed by cancer and his life by grief. Although she is quick to emphasize that these are not established facts, but rather rumors made up, she argues that this is a nice myth of origins, one that serves as a perfect focus for revolt. This alternative version of their origin myth transforms the significance of their existence from that of the exploited victim to a new narrative with love, resistance, and transgenerational collective trauma. By naming the Chinese woman I, a term signifying love in both Chinese and Japanese, and highlighting their enduring love and resilience even in the face of her passing, this narrative, this new myth, recasts their origin story as a tale of transgenerational history of injustice and resistance. And this illustrates how Abby and her sister not only engage in the process of re mythologizing, but also mismating Mesopoeia to fill the void left by their initially misled origin or Eurocentric colonial myth. So in conclusion, um, the emergence of Science Fiction Studies 3.0 compels, I think, all of us to reconsider how East Asian and Asian American science fiction should be created in the future. And recently, uh, unfortunately, several works from East Asia, from Korea, uh, including films like The Moon, Jungi, and Black Knight, have failed tragically, right, critically and commercially <laughs> I believe a key reason for these three films' failure is their uh, reliance on merely copying the structures and narrative typical of Anglophone science fiction. So superficially localizing only by substituting characters and settings with Asian faces. Instead, I argue, East Asian science fiction should entail a redefinition of science and science fiction through the lens of Asian myths and religion. This approach should not merely adopt myths as fixed stories, but should embrace a re mythologizing and mythopoetic perspective. If researchers revisit East Asian literary traditions with this new perspective, I think we can trace a rich lineage of science fiction in East Asia, from pre modern myths and folk tales to feminist comics of the 1980s, occult and fantasy novels of the 1990s, and so, and so on. I think this will set the stage for the new science fiction in the age of science fiction studies 3.0. Thank you.